Welcome everyone. This is BizHack Live, our weekly webinar series on digital marketing for small businesses. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the founder and CEO of BizHack Academy and the host of BizHack Live. Today we have a fabulous session. It's going to be with the amazing Joe Laratro of Tandem Interactive. And we're going to be talking about the nine steps that you can take today to improve your presence on Google. And I wanted to take a second and talk about how I think about Google because I do think that uh, it helps to kind of frame the conversation a little bit about how Google works and how it can help for your business, help your business. So Google is the front page of the internet. It's the front door of the internet. In other words, the way you get people to interact with your business is through Google. Now, there's a whole nother sphere, uh, which is social media, where Facebook, which owns Instagram and WhatsApp is dominant. But when it comes to people finding and discovering your website, your content, often their first place is to go to search and then they find you from there. So in order for you to be successful as a business, you must be on Google and discoverable. The way I think about this is all of you actually have two audiences. Your first audience is your current and potential customers. No surprise there. We all are aware that when we are putting things online, we are speaking to our current and potential customers. We're also talking to our staff. We're talking to our investors. But foremost in our minds as marketers is we're talking to our potential customers. The other thing that you're speaking to, your other audience, is the Google bot. This is a algorithm that is crawling the internet, sometimes called a web crawler, and looking at the content on your website and categorizing it, and then making decisions about when to surface your content in searches and on ads when people put certain search terms in. That's what today is about, how to talk to bots. And I gotta tell you, for most businesses, talking to bots is more important than talking to people because if you don't talk to the bots properly, you're never gonna get seen by the people. That's what we mean by the front door. And if you think about Google as a mansion, it's actually a mansion with three front doors. The first front door is the organic search door. That's sometimes called search engine optimization, SEO. So when people talk about SEO, what they're really talking about is Google searches and free listings that show up as the search results. The second door that we always think about is the ads. So Google allows you to pay to be promoted as a prominent listing in those search results. They actually appear above the organic results. So Google's paid offerings, and there are many, is the second door to its, the Google mansion. But there's a third door that not all of you are aware of, and it's called local. The local door includes the critically important Google My Business, as well as other local offerings, including local ads that are specifically geared for location-based businesses. And this is an essential component to your Google strategy. So Joe is gonna to talk to you about those three main pillars of Google, and we're not even touching YouTube, which is the one of the world's I think it's the world's second largest search engine after google.com that is also owned by Google. It's a totally different animal and a topic for another day. So let me share my screen. I wanna thank uh, first and foremost, um, our season two sponsors, um, uh, the Miami Marketers and South Florida IMA. I also want to thank today's partner, Tandem Interactive. That's Joe's firm. It's one of the best SEO firms in South Florida. Highly recommend it. We're a client. And then I did also want to take a minute and do a little bit of bragging 
We were recognized this past week with an award, a global campaign of the year from the American Marketing Association. That's a beautiful uh, picture from the award ceremony. Uh, Lilia there accepting our award. We, she did wear a mask except for taking that photo. And we are so proud because that award was a recognition of this BizHack Live series. And I just wanna take a second and recognize Lilia Posos. This is your award, Lilia. You have been tireless in making this happen, in promoting this. You were the one who convinced me back in March that we needed to do this even as my business was cratering and I was losing all my customers. And you said, Dan, we gotta do this. The community needs us. This is what we're best at. Let's give and we will receive. And I believed you and you were right. And BizHack is on track to double in size as a result of this BizHack Live series. I want you to know from the depths of my heart, Lilia, that I so appreciate you and this award is your award. Thank you. And if you could, guys, and I know you've been doing this, throw in the chat. Lilia is classic behind the scenes, making it happen. She does not like the spotlight. I love it. Uh, but she is the engine that makes this run. She's the one who sends all those reminders, you know, make sure the guests have everything they need. Um, make sure that I show up and I'm at my best. Um, she really is the, the, the juice uh, that's inside of this orange. Uh, I'm just the guy who gets to show up and uh, be on camera. So, you know, to many of our past guests, um, many of our students, um, many of the amazing business owners that are here uh, on this call, uh, Cheryl, one of our instructors, Ellen Marchman, who we featured, um, you know, Other and Ricardo and Michelle and Serena and Julia uh, and Carrie, who are part uh, and active members of our trainings. You know, this is a great opportunity for you to just say thanks to Lilia for all that she does to make your experience great. So thank you, Lilia. Um, all right. Thank so you. you're welcome. Uh, without further ado, I did want to introduce uh, the amazing featured guest for today, uh, Joe Laratro. I did want to acknowledge Cheryl, uh, who is a former president of the South Florida IMA, for connecting me with Joe. Um, what makes me love Joe is, I mean, he has credentials up the wazoo around search engine marketing and, social, and, and SEO. Um, he runs one of the top boutique firms in South Florida. You're going to learn his expertise today. But what makes Joe really amazing is he is someone who loves to teach. Uh, he's a gifted uh, instructor. Uh, he's taught some of the first courses ever in search engine marketing at S San Francisco University. And he is an incredibly important part of the South Florida ecosystem, been very active with South Florida IMA and other conferences that have brought this knowledge to the community. One other thing about Joe is he is a technician's technician. The man knows more about search engine marketing than I will ever know in my lifetime. And he loves to nerd it out. So what I've asked him to do with this presentation is present it in, in, in normal lay terms, but not to be afraid to go pretty deep and nerdy. And so if we get really nerdy on you, just rest assured that Joe's gonna come back in the next point with something that you can apply to your business no matter how expert you are in SEO. So there's gonna be some nerdy stuff, some really technical stuff because we're talking about talking to bots. We're talking about how to optimize for an algorithm and there's just no way to avoid the nerdiness. And it's actually gonna start out really nerdy because Joe said to me this morning that Google landed a big fat egg on his plate and gave him a bit of a surprise. With that, my dear friend, my mentor, Joe Laratro. Thank you, thank you. You guys hear me okay? All right, cool. Um, so first, congrats, Dan and Lily, on the award. I saw that come on my Instagram feed, which is my social channel of choice, and uh, I was very happy for you guys and, and proud to be part of this. Thank you for having me. Uh, let's get started. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on my background. Dan actually just did a, a really good job, but I'm actually probably more used to being called Nerdy Joe than Amazing Joe. So I think Dan might be the first person to call me Amazing Joe twice in a, in, a, in any time period. So that, that was pretty cool. Thanks. Um, 
to explain kind of how how nerdy nerdy gets in this is that last night I was working with American Eagle and they are doing a site migration from Magento to Big Commerce. And it's a project that's been in play for about two months. It was all well documented. Everything should have been perfect. And all of a sudden we get these grenades of, you know, here's this other website that's migrating over and here's another website that's migrating over that wasn't in the, the original scope. And we're like, okay, well, where are you guys going to host those domains and how are you going to do the redirects? And it was, it was all this important SEO aspects that need to be considered in the planning of doing this site migration that they completely didn't let us know about until really like D-Day. Tomorrow's D-Day. Tomorrow everything has to switch over. So as soon as I'm done with this presentation, it's like, okay, fire up two web servers and get 301 redirect plugins working. It's, it's going to be a very long afternoon and potential evening. Uh, a little bit just about my company. My company was founded in 2006, and I had been in the industry since 2000. So I'm now 14 years old, coming up on 15. And I was built, the company was built on some of the things that I saw that I felt was wrong with the industry. And one of the, the easiest things that I can I can kind of convey to you of any anytime you're working with an agency is that you need to have ownership of everything. You need complete transparency and you need ownership of all the accounts. You should never work with a company that is holding you hostage in any way. And you know, these are again kind of like the, the core concepts or that I, I built my company off of. Um, we've been we've been very successful, we've grown a lot, we were very successful through COVID. And we're looking forward to you know, kind of an amazing 20, 2021. So let's talk a little bit about today. So Dan, I think laid it up perfectly for me where I can be very technical and I can also go very high level. And when I, I put this presentation together, I tried to give it a blend. So if there's anything, anybody that's watching this that has experience is gonna be like, oh, okay, good, good. I know that, I know that. And I'm gonna give you a couple of tips. They're gonna be like, wow, that's amazing. And if you're not familiar with this, then you're gonna get some high level thoughts of, of how to do this yourself and be like, wow, that's great. Or if you're working with a company, how to work with them a little bit better. But these are the main things we're gonna cover today. GMB, Google My Business, which is that local aspect of, of Google that Dan mentioned. We're getting some what I like to call local search excellence, you know, some of just the best tips that I can give you when it comes to local search. And then we're going to shift over a little bit to SEO. And I've put together uh, kind of, let's say, an abridged version of I have a book called The SEO Diet, but this is more for like small local businesses. And then we're going to wrap up with Google local service ads. I didn't really want to get into like the basics of Google ads. But Google Local Service Ads is a newer product. It's about a year and a half old, and it's it's evolving pretty quickly. And I can really show you how to win the game because that's what Google's created is a new game. But like Dan said, I mean, we I've actually had a, a hell of a morning. And uh, breaking news, we came in today to see that a ton of our accounts started looking like this. So if you see on the left side of the screen, restricted targeting. So in October, Google made an announcement that they were trying to prevent discriminatory, and I would even go so far as to say predatory, advertising practices, where the best example of that would be that you're targeting low-income demographics and putting high interest rate loans in front of them. They don't want, they don't want their ecosystem being used for that type of advertising. But it's blown up into areas that it wasn't originally supposed to touch. So we got hit by this this morning and it's not, it's not one company. It's actually quite a few different companies. I mean, we have a, a staffing company that got hit by it. And the best thing I can do in terms of if you're currently using Google ads, I can tell you exactly how to monitor this. And if you're not, and you have an agency or somebody that you're working with, I would try to put this in front of them today. So what you can do is you can go into your notifications, which I put a little, arrow of where you go. And then under notifications, you can choose your types. And this is what it, it looks like on the left normally, you know, get notifications if your payment failed, things like this. But now we have these policies and these policies were just added. It might have been today, it might have been a week ago, but they are very new. And you can see, I mean, I'll read a couple of them. There's policies around restricting targeting age, gender, parental status, demographics, audiences, and location exclusions. I mean, think about if if you were taking a, 
a social media advertising class even a year ago. I mean, these would be all the things that you'd be put in your face of like, these are the best ways you can target. And these are the ways you can really dig into your audience. And now we have Google saying like, no, you know, we don't want you using those ways because you may be using them for, for bad reasons of how you're doing your targeting. So this was like craziness this morning, Chinese fire drill. I mean, everybody was just running around trying to, to deal with this the best we can. And so far the feedback that we've got from Google from two different um, channel partners is that they're false positives. We can appeal them and they don't apply to us. So it's some automated algorithm that caught this and flagged it, but then there's downtime. And I mean, right now you're talking about December 9th, we've got you know maybe one more good week of business this year, maybe two, but one for sure, we don't wanna lose momentum and potentially our clients got hit with a, a momentum loss this morning. So back to our regularly scheduled programming. So two, two quick points. Number one is we're gonna be sending you, uh, those of you who attend, a copy of these slides. So uh, don't feel like you have to take mad notes or screen grabs. The other thing is, um, just so I'm clear on what's happened, um, Google has algorithmically determined that there are certain types, categories of ads that they don't want to be discriminatory or predatory. Um, the classic example of this is real estate ads, but it sounds like what happened this morning is ads that were not normally part of this dragnet got caught and they are using targeting criteria, such as the list you showed us around age or geography or gender that Google's algorithm is flagged as predatory. Yes. Well, okay. The, yes. It, I don't, I don't want to say particularly as predatory or discriminatory, but they flagged it. So they're yeah, just so they flagged it. They, they, and does yeah. that mean that those ads are no longer running until the issue is resolved? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, so they've like, flagged these ads, the ads are down and yeah. you need to resolve them quickly uh, in order for you to continue to advertise right before the holidays. And why would they put out, this is, this is a little bit of a, uh, uh, of a, um, facetious question but why would they put this out right before the holidays um so the the timing of this i don't think the timing of this is any is ever good but it's certainly not good for the holidays and i, I mean if i were to guess that maybe there's just a higher rate of bad players in the advertising industry right now trying to take advantage of things they shouldn't be taking advantage of Another roadblock is that, you know, we're still in COVID and Google's working remotely and response time is slower. So where a year ago this time, if this happened, I could probably guarantee that if we were down at 8 a.m., we were up by 10 a.m. I can't guarantee that these ads will be up in two days at this point. I mean, we've, we've had some serious slowdowns from the responsiveness side on Google. It's not, our, not like the service side of it, but the Google side of it, which is a little bit dangerous. And, and there's also a larger lesson in this, which is why I think it's worth pausing for a second, which is your audience is the Google bots and we, the algorithms. And we don't know what the algorithms say. That's a trade secret. They get changed without notice. And they're a little bit whimsical. Like sometimes they'll ban something they shouldn't. They don't, they're not perfect. Far from it. Yeah. And, and so just, just this is a really important point because there's a whole lot of horseshit that SEO firms will spoon you. But one thing that's not horseshit is that it does take time for SEO to work and that Google is a very fickle audience because they change all the time and without notice. More than once a day on average, the Google algorithm changes. And so it's a tough business that, that Joe, you're in. And the reason why a lot of SEO firms struggle to get results for their clients are not always for reasons of incompetence, but also it's because they're they're dealing with a very complex and challenging uh, audience in the Google bot. All right, so two things based on that before we move on. Uh, one very important for everyone to understand, paid search and organic search. So Dan mentioned the kind of three ways to get in. So what I just spoke about was paid search. So that's pay-per-click advertising, PPC, but paid search it has nothing to do with SEO. SEO is organic search, which is where we're going now. And we're going to talk about local organic and I'll, I'll get into more about that, but they are church and state within the, the search engines. It's what happens on paid doesn't affect organic and what happens on organic really shouldn't affect paid. So just important concept. And then in the case where our clients got hurt with the zip code targeting, we were only using zip codes because that's where they service. 
Now there, there's certainly other ways you can use zip code targeting, but in the, the particular example I showed you, it was really just because this location services these zip codes and then this location may be 100 miles away, but services like bumping up zip codes. So it's very important that we can target by zip codes because otherwise we'd be targeting geographies that we don't want to hit. All right, but let's, so let's move into, again, change back to regularly scheduled programming, Google My Business. So I'm not gonna walk you through like how to set up Google My Business, but I am gonna point out the most important things with Google My Business right now. And the first one is that the category that you choose or categories, plural, that for your business are important because they actually open up groups of keywords. And this is the best example I can give of this is that we work with a lot of rehab centers and we can write you know, drug rehab in the company name, we could write drug rehab in the description, but if they are not, if we didn't select the right category that opens up drug rehab as a keyword, they won't rank for the, for the phrase. And that's really important. So the correct category for drug rehabs is actually addiction centers. But so like when you think about the categories, think about a category as a group of keywords. Now, when you're doing category research, to choose which ones you should do, it's very easy because you just pick your main keywords and then see what shows up. So in this example, drug rehab addiction center, addiction treatment center shows up in all three. But when I search pool service, I get swimming pool repair service, pool cleaning service, and swimming pair, and another swimming pair, pool repair service. So if I'm focused on my GMB and trying to Google my business and trying to build it out, I want to do some keyword research and see where are the people that are ranking very highly and what categories are they using. Another pretty important part of Google My Business is tracking. If you do not use a tracking URL when you put your website URL in your profile, then the traffic that comes from Google My Business is not easily identifiable. Some of it will show up as direct, some of it will show up as organic, some of it will show up as referral. And that's all a function of how you're using Google Maps because maybe you're using a Google Maps um, application on your phone and you click on the website, that's is different than if you were searching in Google and the maps result shows up and you click it. But for SEOs, we want to take credit for any of the work that we're doing here. So by tagging it with this UTM source, let me put the little, where's the pointer? Does it show up easily or no? That pointer is not easily showing up. But if you use that UTM source equals Google GMB and UTM medium equals organic, when you look at an analytics platform, in this case, particularly Google Analytics, you'll be able to track that. So here's what that looks like. So now um, I can look in my Google Analytics and I can look under the channels that are driving traffic to my website and I can see the difference between Google and GMB listing. Now in my note here, I say you have to be careful because you need a year over year lapse in order to see this correctly. So in this example, this is before a year over year lapse. And if we just did simple math, it looks like Google at the time period we're comparing has actually decreased in organic traffic. And GMB listing is you know, accelerated ridiculously because there are 6,000 visits. But if I add the GMB listing traffic to Google, then we'd be net up 19.85%. So this is what it looks like before a year over year lapse. Now, once we get to the year over year lapse, then everything starts looking even better. So now it's a year later, I'm comparing the numbers and now I can see that regular Google organic has grown 17% and the GMB listing traffic has grown 19%, 19 19.7, call it 20. So this is very valuable for anyone that's doing work on GMB and trying to prove their worth either to their CEO, if it's a client, whatever it is, this is very important. All right, next one is tracking phone numbers. So if you've ever watched a webinar or attended a training session or read something about local SEO, one of the biggest concepts is called the NAP, the name address phone number, and that your NAP matches everywhere. One of the things that Google gave us and it became like official, and I think it's about two years ago now, is that we can use a primary phone number that's a tracking phone number. 
So using a third party service like a dialogue tech or a March X or call tracking metric, something like that. And then have the additional phone number be the NAP phone number. So the additional phone number would be the phone number that matches, let's say your the main number on your website, matches your business listings. I mean, anywhere else you see your website, the additional phone number would be your NAP phone number. And this is an approved tactic. Another thing to pay attention to when you're looking at your profile is if you're using Google ads, which we're not gonna to talk too much about today other than my little updated breaking news. But if you are using Google ads, you want to make sure that in your Google My Business profile, you put a tracking phone number. The reason for doing this is if you're using Google ads, which is the paid ads up at the top, and somebody searches for your business and your listing shows up and it's got your maps listing kind of embedded in it, your regular Google Maps phone number would show. So the paid side of the business would be getting attribution. I'm sorry, the paid side of the business would not be getting the attribution for the call, where if we have this phone number in there, then the paid does get the attribution for the call. This is splitting hairs, but if you're really tracking at that level and trying to look at ROI and make sure that your investment is, is worth it, these little points you know, will make a big difference at the end especially for small local businesses. Something that is going away in the local search industry are aggregators. I mean, this is a, a local search ecosystem infographic. It's very cool. Lots of us use it, but it's something that's, that's going away. And I would almost say that COVID had something to do with that, with, with what Google has done to Google My Business is they don't need lots and lots of resources to verify the business information anymore. When Google was building their original databases for the map section, they were looking at all these other sources and trying to verify like this is a real business. But today, there's so many things that they can count on with their own data and who's submitting that data to them. The alliance on this type of a service just really isn't that necessary. I would still do it if I had budget, but um, it's something that even six months from now, we might be like, uh, you don't you don't really worry about aggregators anymore. So let's do a, a local SEO hit session, high intensity training. So I already mentioned the common nap, we're good. City state mentioned in content and meta tags. So city state is always important because if you're a local business and let's say you're a plastic surgeon and you write the best website ever on plastic surgery, but don't mention that you're in downtown Fort Lauderdale, and Google is looking, it makes it very difficult for Google bots, like Dan mentioned, that, you know, the other audience we're developing content for to understand that this website is relevant to downtown Fort Lauderdale. Super important. Today's world of design is mobile first and mobile first is great, but mobile first leaves out a lot of old SEO concepts of site structure and interlinking because we're focused on this little hamburger menu that looks good on a phone. So while we have no choice but to be mobile first, we do have to think about other concepts of content growth on a website that are beyond just that simple page. HTTPS, secure sites, is not optional. They're necessary, 100%. Speed is very important. Schema, I don't want to get, that's a little geeking out a little bit, but schema are ways that we can code the website to give a little bit more information to a search engine bot about what that content is on a page. Um, embedding maps from Google is very good, another good indicator. And phone number prominence, this one blows me away, is, I mean, one of the first things I have anyone on my team look at when we're analyzing a website, even before like SEO, is where's the phone number? I mean, if you're on a phone and you reach this business and you want to talk to them right now, you don't want to fill out a form on your phone, you're driving, you just want to hit that phone number, you need that phone number prominence. And I've had arguments with companies they are like, well, we don't want anybody calling us. And I said, okay, well, then you shouldn't be doing business. I mean, it's not the self-serve world, you know, doesn't necessarily exist. If every person that hits your website is valuable, you want them to communicate in whatever channel that they can, whether it's phone, form, SMS, like you want you want them, don't waste the opportunity. And phone number prominence to me is just huge. Local SEO is great and working on your GMB is great, but if you don't, if you don't set the cadence of how you're going to routinely manage it, it's gonna fail. And GMB today has really become almost a, a social media platform 
it's it's amazing it's it's a living entity and you have to treat it like that you can't just create it and like walk away from it and there's a lot of things i'm going to talk about for the next probably 10 15 slides that will keep coming back to that theme but these are some things just to pay attention to that can get as part of your routine you should be doing link building, local citation building, which is outreach and just trying to get your business listed as many places as you can online with all the right information, the common name, address, phone number. You want to use tools, this is more on the technical side, but to research your competitors and see like where are they getting links and where are they getting listings and how can we get some of that? And then you want to take the time to actually do that for yourself you want to build brand pages and kind of almost a brand wall up for your business because this gives more indicators to a search engine that you're a real business. Um, unfortunately, we, we, I guess we did start on kind of a bad note of, of Google clamping down because this is a time of year where businesses may be predatory and may be taking advantage of, of the season doing irreputable things. If you're building a, a profile around a business and there's just all these indicators that say you're real, Google's going to accept that and understand that you are a more real business. And that's the difference between, you know, Dan building a, a thriving BizHack Academy community and somebody that's doing crappy lead gen that's going to be an affiliate for some other company that's selling a, a garbage vaporware product. You know, Everything we're doing here, and again, BizHack's a good example of this, like building the social channel, do, posting this on, on YouTube Live and Facebook Live and even Periscope is all great ways to be sending indicators like this is a real kind of thriving community and pay attention. Pay attention to your, your keywords, benchmark your, your positions and look at it quarterly, make sure there's growth. And then you want to use geo-targeted long tail keywords as much as you can. We'll talk about this a little bit more in the, the SEO diet section of this for local. Um, photos to me are one of the most powerful components of Google My Business because it allows you to tell a story through pictures and you can convey what your business really should mean to somebody if they're looking at it. And here's just you know some of the pictures of, of my business, but you know, if you look at the top picture, okay, it's my team. They're all kind of dressed like me. If you, I'm in a suit, if I'm presenting a person, but I'm sitting in my office, so you get the black t-shirt. Uh, we, you know, we used to have a ping pong table. We don't have that kind of room anymore. Now we have desks everywhere, but I mean, that looks like, you know, that looks like kind of a fun team. Like I want to work with those guys, you know, they're creative. There's a real building. There's a real, they're actually expoing someplace. Like the message that I'm trying to convey about my company, we can control there and take, for what you, you know, everybody gets their own interpretation. But I mean, I like that. Um, it's timely, it's fresh. We know we're still in business. There's all kinds of COVID stuff now that you can be posting, but you have to monitor user generated content because people can post anything onto your GMB. And in this case, this is a, a picture of some like broken equipment. And we can act, you actually get that taken off of your GMB because you don't want somebody looking at your business and then some, you know, an upset customer that posted something that looks pretty bad. You can take that off because you could just say that that's not that I think it's the fifth choice down. It's not a photo or video of the place. So cleanliness or health of your GMB is something that has to be monitored on a regular basis. And if you set it and forget it, that you could be rampant with bad imagery and bad messaging about the company. Again, this is a, a very living, living entity now, and kind of goes perfectly into this slide. Entities. So, just the way I talked about the the social profiles and building a brand wall around your business, that is also helping Google understand entities. And the best way I can explain what how Google looks at an entity today is. Um, my name. So I'm Joe Laratro. I had a grandfather, Joe Laratro. I had his his first son, which is my dad's half brother, Joe Laratro, and my son, Joe Laratro. So my grandfather, Joe Laratro, has passed away. My uncle worked for Raytheon. If you Google, you'd see him. And that's that's one entity around Joe Laratro. And then there's my son who does transformer videos and stuff on YouTube. And that's a different Joe Laratro. So Google has to try to identify if somebody's searching for my name, which one of the four of us are they looking for? Now, luckily I have a fairly unique name, so it's really only four that they're looking for. But imagine how complicated that is when you're trying to put entities on like your local subway, which subway are you looking for to get fresh sandwiches? 
reputation is part of that. And they're trying to tie all the pieces together. When you do a search, they're trying to also understand like which Joe LaRatro are you looking for? So entities are important and you know, really think about that when you're doing everything online specific to your business. Reviews are a big deal. Um, and it's not just Google reviews. I mean, we have to look at Facebook reviews can show up in SERPs. Yelp reviews are a big deal. Dan and I had a, a good conversation this morning about Yelp. I don't even pay attention to them anymore. But there are clients that can like thrive on Yelp and focus on getting good Yelp reviews. And I know businesses that will do everything they can to not work with um, customers that they know are avid Yelpers because avid Yelpers are usually pretty negative. Uh, but even on reviews, you got to look at industry sites because there are some very specific reviews that'll show up uh, in the moving industry. There's there's got to be ten <laughs> sites that do nothing but review moving companies. So when I like to talk about a having a review strategy, my my favorite example is. Um, the car dealership model. I mean, you, you buy a car from a dealership or you take a car back to get serviced. They are instantly working on you when like neuromarketing of they're trying to persuade you to make sure that when you get the survey, you fill it out. You're very happy. You're going to fill out all five stars or, you know, tens out of one to 10, whatever it is. And now there's platforms out there that help with this. You know, reputation.com is actually pretty cool. It was a, a slimy website a decade ago, but now it's a killer platform for managing your reviews. Chatmeter is cool. DBA platform is, is more of a techier one. And then Bird's Eye is very popular right now as well. But there's lots of these out there that can help you. Going back to the, the car dealership. So you get your car serviced. You're being asked, you know, were you happy? Yes. Um, if you get a review, will you fill it out? Yes. Then you know a week later you get a phone call. Um, if you get that survey, you know will you take the time to fill it out? Yes. So these are all these are all kind of persuasion principles that are getting you to when it does come, you're going to take the time to do it, and it's it's going to make it happen. Um, email is good, but you might get a lot of emails for reviews, so that's not always you know, great to follow up with. Um, you can't reward the person filling out the review, but I found that you can reward the team that gets the review and I'll explain on the next slide how we do that. Uh, let's jump there. So let's pay attention to the review, the, the rules here for reviews. So most sites don't want you asking for just positive reviews. Yelp is notorious for this. Like it's okay that Yelp will give you a sticker and you can put a sticker on a wall that says review us on Yelp, but that's about the extent of it. They don't want you sending out links to for the, you to review them. One of the best ways around this that I found is SMS. If you can send a review link through a phone, very hard for any Google, Yelp, anyone to understand that that's not you typing it in or how you got there, that it doesn't put any flags up that it's a it's an incentivized review, let's say. Um, I love employee incentivization. And one of my favorite tactics right now is to use a hashtag and team names. Um, this works for anyone. This can work for a restaurant. This can work for a moving company. This can work for pest control. But imagine, let's use pest control as an example. So you just, um, you were called to a house. They had a roach problem. You sprayed, you know, a week later, they're super happy. They call you, you know, you guys did a great job. No more dead roaches. We're in South Florida, palmetto bugs, whatever you want to call them. Um, you could say, you know, would you mind writing us a review on Google? I'll actually get a $50 bonus. Um, and you could, and can you put hashtag, you know, Joe Roaches, it's a nasty name, but you get the point. I mean, it'll stand out. And now the people at the company that are paying attention to the reviews, they see that, you know, hashtag Joe Roaches, like, oh, wow, <laughs> 50 bucks, boom. And now you've got a great review. You've got a very real review and you're identifying the team that you did it. If you're going to respond to reviews, be very careful. You don't want to be negative. You always want to take it offline. Uh, there's more opportunity to turn a person that was unhappy with your service into uh, an advocate if you if you address them correctly and make them feel like they're part of the process. Um, I have a very great story of Cash for Gold and one of, what was almost my downfall probably 15 years ago, 14 years ago. I won't get into it now, but um, it, it's responding reviews is important and be positive on either side. If you made a mistake, I mean, give them a phone number, give them a, a, a better channel to reach out to you to try to resolve it. And if they, even if they were, did something that was um, 
they're complimenting you. I mean, take the time to compliment them back. It shows that you're very engaged and we're back to that GMB is, is social, that you're, you're engaging in all areas. Here's some good reputation resources, rep by Andy Beal, Hug Your Haters by Jay Bear. Now, I said GMB is really becoming a social network. They've taken a lot of the features from Google+, Plus, which is now defunct, and um, brought them into it to make it very lively. So some of the newer features are Q&A. Again, think social media. Like You can actually go there and you can ask a question about any business. The only issue with that is anybody can answer that question, not just the business owner. So if you're not monitoring the questions, then you might be getting questions and answers that you don't really want as part of your business. It's better if you control the messaging. Uh, it's also a great way that you can post FAQs. If you've just got common questions that people ask about your business, um, you know, in, in Dan's case, it might, might be that, you know, where's your, where are your in-person events? And he could say, well, right now, you know, we're focused on international webinars and, you know, we'll revisit it after COVID or something like that. Uh, another side note yesterday, I mean, I help run a, a conference that is based in Vegas and it's one of the largest search conferences in the world. And we found out yesterday that the Las Vegas Convention Center is staying closed through May, which means that they've been closed since like last March, that there's an entire year of conferences that would have happened at the Las Vegas Convention Center, which is huge, um, that didn't happen. And now they're lapping that and getting space next year is gonna be pretty tough. All right, so Q&A. Um, this is what it looks like on an actual result page. Uh, make sure that you go into your notifications. So kind of like where I showed you in the beginning of notifications for Google ads, you also want to make sure you have notifications turned on for Google My Business. So you're, whenever something happens, you get you know instant notification of it. Um, you definitely want to respond before anyone else does because you want to control the messaging. Um, businesses have the opportunity to actually flag something as inappropriate. So if somebody uh, went on uh, my GMB and said, you know, why does Tandem Interactive suck? Okay, well, it's not a very good question. Boom, I can delete it. We don't suck. Here's where it it's pretty interesting, and I have a story behind this one. So, and I sw it's weird because I always ask this question when I'm traveling, and I think that everybody knows what Rec 90 gas is, and apparently it's a very isolated to South Florida thing. And I would have thought that like anywhere where there's big, you know, heavy equipment, they use Rec 90 gas. But if you don't know what Rec 90 gas is, it is ethanol free gasoline. And it's really designed for recreational vehicles or heavy machinery that should not have ethanol because ethanol could be very dangerous to plastic parts and motors. And in South Florida, it's most used really for boats. So I do a search for Rec 90 gas. I get this, I get a result. It's a Sunoco gas station, not that far from my office. I drive the Sunoco gas station. They don't have Rec 90 gas. They said, oh, the Rec 90, the Sunoco down the street does. So I said, okay. So I drive five blocks. There's another Sunoco. I get there and I says, where's, I ask, where's the Rec 90 gas? They say, no, it's at the other one. I said, no, I just came from there. They said, yeah, but we've searched on Google. It says it's there. I said, I understand you searched on Google. That's how I got there. There's no Rec 90 gas. So then I'm like, well, why did they rank for Rec 90 gas? Somebody asked the question, do you have Rec 90 fuel at the pump? And somebody answered yes. So that was a signal sent to Google that unfortunately is a bad signal because they don't have it. So I, I actually, I feel like I have to start speeding up here. Um, let me get a time check. 115, wow. Okay, we got a lot to cover. Um, I'm gonna go a little bit faster and I'm gonna try to stay on the higher level stuff and uh, and stay out of like the nitty gritty, but um, we can, I can always follow up with the nitty gritty and the questions at the end. Google posts, again, this is very much on the social side and you can post any content. You can post events, you can post blog posts, you can post offers. Um, right now there's a COVID post. I don't recommend using the COVID post because it actually blocks one of your main results and it's sticky. So any post you do appear after the, the COVID post. So unless it's, you're in a, it's not fair because South Florida is still very much open where I've, I've worked with people all over the U S that they're closing down again. And it's, it's different. So our views in South Florida, like everything's kind of back to normal where I, I work with people in Chicago that they can't go to a restaurant right now. So it, this is definitely regional specific, but for me in South Florida, I wouldn't be too worried about a COVID post being first, but there are certainly places in the country that you probably do need a, a COVID post. 
you do get reporting when you do the post. It's a very quick way to get your content indexed. And again, if you see that results um, in your GMB listing anywhere on Google, you've got more real estate that you're holding. So it's very good. <laughs> this is a great example because all my sons actually just abandoned the star star move branding, which I, I don't, I don't agree with, but I respect why they did it because they don't own star star move. Another company does. And they felt like they were investing in branding that they didn't own the, the branding that they were investing in. So totally understand the situation. But at one point star star move was something that we just, we had that message everywhere and it matched, it matched TV, it matched the trucks, it matched radio, everything said star star move. And too frequently I'll watch a TV commercial and another South Florida company consolidated credit. Um, or debt.com, same, same company, they do this killer commercial of debt suckers. And they show like these bats flying and they're debt suckers. And it, it comes usually around Halloween. And I'm like, that's such a, that's such a cool message. And then you go to their website or landing pages and there's nothing about these debt suckers. And it's just a missed opportunity of having, you know, a nice unified cross channel message. If you are using vanity URLs, so this could be short codes. I mean, I think we're all getting um, very familiar with the, the QR codes be at restaurants. I mean, to me, that's probably one of the most accepted innovations uh, because of COVID <laughs> it, it, for technology. I mean, that's just amazing that like QR codes is something that just really never caught on until now. And now like everyone knows how to use a QR code. I mean, my kids can actually kids prize and a good example. My parents can use a QR code now because they go to a restaurant and they're like, oh, I got to read the menu. Uh, but if I'm using QR codes and I want to track that, I want to add that UTM coding. So that same UTM coding that, or similar actually, that I showed you the example of to use in your maps listing, you can use stuff like that and be able to track how, the, how these different channels are performing, whether it's radio, TV, print, QR codes on you know, a table in a restaurant. Um, and then last part of this area is um, Barnacle SEO. And just the very simple version of this is if you're a pizza restaurant and you search for best pizza restaurants and the first five results are like directories that list the restaurants, you want to make sure that your website is on those websites instead of trying to outrank them for best pizza restaurant. So sometimes you just have to understand that your keywords may be in a in a category that's not that maybe too competitive. And instead of trying to like beat those websites, like join them, I mean, be on those websites. When somebody clicks in, you rank and you're gonna get that traffic that's like flowing through those websites. So that actually came from Will Scott who is based in New Orleans. Probably Barnacles might even be more relevant in New Orleans than they are in South Florida. Uh, on the take home topics, no, I didn't add nothing new there. Okay, so let's see, time check again. We've got, got what, about 10 minutes, Dan? Okay, um, all right, so I've got, I've got two topics that I want to hit. So I'm going to go through these quickly. Hey, Joe, and... I can stay for three hours. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Um, Joe, um, we're, we're going to just go long. Okay. So don't rush through the material. Okay. And those who have to leave at 1.30 will leave at 1.30. Okay, you got it. Um, so I'm still gonna, I'm gonna do what I said before. I'm gonna stick with the high level stuff and try not to get too much in the nitty gritty, but get the points across. You guys are gonna get copies of the slides. I am a little um, text heavy on slides, but always because I count on them being distributed and it's not always easy to remember everything I said, but if you read it, you get it. Uh, so the SEO diet just as a concept is that SEO is not about doing a one-time set of work to a website. It's about the ongoing work. And if you're not actually loading pages on a website and you're not actually doing link building, SEO is not going to succeed. I mean, SEO is all about the growth of the website and the plan. And that's what this is about. You need the structure there and you need like the, you know, the bones that are good to build off of. But once you have that, I mean, you're good. So I'll skip my jokes here um, and jump right in. So this would be the plan if you're doing this for your own company. So just the perspective here is this is my company. I'm a small business. This is what I need to do. Or I was just hired to be the marketer of a new company or somebody that really hasn't invested in SEO. These are the, these are the first steps that I would take. So I want to make sure that my site is registered with the Google Search Console, Microsoft Webmaster Tools. 
I want to make sure that I have a Google My Business page and Facebook page. And I'm not going to walk you through how to do that. It's pretty self-explanatory now. They both do a good job of what to set up. But I gave you in, in my local search excellence part earlier, you know, some of the things to pay attention to. I want to benchmark some KPIs because, again, I want to prove that the work that I'm doing is working and, and is productive, not just I'm doing the work for the sake of doing it. I want to crawl the website. So there's an old tool out there called G Site Crawler. There's a new, well, not a newer tool, but a very good tool called Screaming Frog that imagine you can crawl your website the same way a search engine would and, and flatten the website into a, a spreadsheet. So a spreadsheet that would say, this is page one, this is the title, this is the description, this is your images, these are your alt tags, like all of the components on a page, but flattened into a spreadsheet. Pretty cool, because that's an easy way to, to be able to, to manage it. Um, and then we want to start looking at the meta tags, the titles and descriptions of a page, and see how relevant are they, are they are to the content. Also keeping in mind, if we're local, what I said before about city and state, that we want to keep geography in there as well. So with Google My Business, we take, we take care of, I think we covered all of this. So um, the only thing to add here is that Google My Business has a mobile app that everything that I'm seeing, all the indicators are that anything that you do through the mobile app is more trusted than if you do it online. And we're going, we're going a step even further is that if you make changes to Google My Business and you're in the location, that seems to be even a higher indicator to Google that like that's a legit change, do it quickly. So I definitely recommend if you're doing anything with Google My Business, you should install the app on your phone. So that was week one. Week two, we optimized meta tags. So again, title and description, main ones. Um, I normally teach rules of title descriptions. We're not gonna do it today, but titles are the most important part of your page. And in, it, in the simplest form, they should be keyword rich and explain the idea or the concept of the page. Uh, in bold, I have We Are Open. One of the, the greatest things that we've seen during COVID is adding We Are Open to your title tags. Uh, again, the, the across the U.S. right now is incredibly different depending on where you live of what, what is open and what isn't. In South Florida, We Are Open may not be as relevant as it would be right now in California or Illinois. I mean, there, I think it would be absolutely mission critical that if your business is actually open, you put We Are Open in the title tag. Um, I have some really cool stats of click-through rates and, and changes that we saw after we did that. Um, and one, time, one of the questions I always get when I say that is, okay, well, when do we take it off? And I would say right now, we still haven't taken it off. And based on the world today, December, 2020, I don't know. I mean, Las Vegas Convention Center is closed through May. I mean, we are open maybe through May and we'll see. Optimize the content. When you're optimizing the content on the website, we make sure that we're including that city state that we're trying to cover. Analyze our internal linking structure. Make sure we've got some nice cross-linking between the site. You know, it could be nav links. It could be footer links. It could be in content links. I don't want to get too, too techy there. Um, local citations. The simplest way I can explain a local citation would be if I was looking for where I could list my business name, phone number, and address, it would be like a chamber of commerce. Like, okay, I want to make sure that my business it shows up if somebody goes to the Fort Lauderdale Chamber of Commerce, there's a list of my business because I'm in Fort Lauderdale. That's simple. But you want to get a lot of that out there because that's, that's feeding Google and saying that, again, you're a real business. There's a tool that you can use called WhiteSpark that can help you find those type of links to get and sites to go on. It's pretty cool. Engage four social media sites, build out optimized profiles. That's that brand wall. Now I move on to week four. Did we skip week three? No. Week four. Um, now we're done with the website as it exists today. It's optimized. All On every page, the title tag is good. The description is good. The content has keywords in it. It's got some geography in it. Now let's set up a blog. Let's make sure that we've got some schema, which is the back end. Again, techie, let's we'll skip that. And we get to the end of month one and we review it. Now, for there to be success at the end of month one, things had to happen to the website. It can't just be that we were planning for a month and we were thinking about it for a month and we, we wrote out guides for a month. Like It has to be that things changed on the website. Otherwise, there's not going to be results. But if we did, and even if we just follow that, that, that pace of, of week by week that I just 
pointed out, you should actually see results pretty quickly at the end of a month. So pretty neat. Go back, compare to current, the, the original benchmarks. Now, I mentioned the beginning of the SEO diet. To me, it's all about the plan. So it's not just that we have an optimized site. It's that we have a plan for content moving forward. So right now in our content plans and really the content plans that we've developed for clients by quarter since Q2 of this year, COVID and safety is, is in every one of them. I mean, in every one of them, we're still, we're adding blogs about the current st state of COVID in that business or how we're interacting or how we might've innovated. Um, safety, what's the safety in the office? What's the safety of meeting with people, doing virtual meetings, things like that, um, all very important having a plan for how much content should be added to the website. So even if you're a small local business, I use my brother-in-law as an example for this all the time. He's a, he's a dentist in Hollywood, Florida. And we looked at his website and it was like 10 pages. And I said, okay, well, you can rank for some keywords with 10 pages, but you're not going to hit, you know, these long phrases of uh, children's cosmetic dentistry in let's say even a neighboring town. So Pembroke Pines, which is west of Hollywood. I mean, he has to build all that content out. And it's not always that easy to do it. So having a, like a quarterly plan of we're going to write a couple articles for the website, we're going to write a couple of cool blog posts, that's going to help the website grow over time. And then with that growth comes more traffic. There should be some time dedicated toward local citations and link building. And then using a tool like moz.com local or any of the aggregators I said before all have reporting that show where you have errors, where you have local sites that you may not have a uniform NAP that the phone number doesn't match or that it's an unclaimed listing. And that's all, that's all kind of hygiene that you want to keep up. That's month one. So month two through 12 are, you know, getting even further into the reviews, um, here, there's a, a link to a blog dealer on it's a auto dealers, auto dealers and the technology companies that service auto dealers are actually unbelievable companies to follow in local search space. I mean, they are on the, the bleeding edge always and really give good information. And it's a, it's a very limited market of companies that service auto dealers. So they're giving away information that is not really competitive, you know, like almost anti-competitive to them that you can use it in any industry. Reporting is important. Implementation tracking is huge. Using like a Basecamp or an Asana or something where you can say that, you know, okay, we updated these 10 pages. And then a month later, this was the result of updating them. Um, every six months, I mean, plans do get stale. So figuring out a way to refresh what you're doing can be a simple, in, in, to my metaphor, I mean, hiring, like it's like hiring a personal trainer. If you keep doing the same routine for six months, like maybe, maybe it's just not going to, you're not going to get results anymore. So hiring a consultant or an agency or somebody to like come in and audit the work, see what you're doing, make sure that you're still using the, the most current tactics, or maybe it's time to just change everything up. Conferences are fantastic because of COVID, the online learning opportunities right now, paid and free are absolutely through the roof. I mean, I sit and spend more time watching recordings than I ever have, I think in my life. And I feel like I'm still, I'm still as, I, my finger's still on the pulse of what's happening in the industry as much as it ever has been, which I always really got from in-person conferences. My only place I've lost in is a lot of the personal relationships and growth. I get to see them on like these, you know, Zooms and stuff, but it's not the same as being in person. All right, so last section and timing wise, this is where we go over. So I will, I will hit this quickly, but just to explain local service ads, this is a, a sub product of Google ads. It is designed for local businesses that are, that maybe don't have the wherewithal or a website uh, to generate leads. So this is creating almost a, a CRM for them because you can manage the whole lead process through Google local service ads. It's available to, I mean, most local businesses, fence repair, electricians, plumbers, attorneys, accountants, I mean, you name it, like there are local service ads that, that might be applicable. Um, I won't get into the history of it, but it's, it is kind of cool. But this, this caused some problems in the industry because this ad block, which appears on the top of a page, and I'll show you, I'm pretty sure I have some screenshots of this. Um, it's taken about 35% of the verticals away. And in the, re, in the, in the most simple you know, true cost of what this means to the industry is that there were a lot of companies that 
uh, there were, sorry, there were a lot of aggregators and lead generation companies that were in spaces that, that are, that can't participate in this product. So imagine, um, let's stick with moving for a moment that if you're going to move and you search for a moving company, the first two ads might've been companies that were like moving.com that want to collect your information. They're going to sell it to four other companies where now if you see the local service ads, they have to be real companies. But if we decrease the supply by 20 to 35%, um, that means that the cost of what's left potentially is going to go up because you've got less supply and more demand. So now you have more demand from the lead aggregators and less supply. So when this happened, this, this, didn't, this didn't bode well for the industry because this makes things cost more. This is actually what the ad unit looks like. So if you see that Google guaranteed up at the top where it said sponsored, and maybe you've been seeing this more and more, um, this is the ad unit for local service ads. And the biggest deal to me here is that you can click on one of those, but there's not a lot. You're not making, let's go back one. If you look at this and just called from here, there's no ad copy. There's nothing telling you why you should work with that company. It's only the company name. So branding is important and it's the stars. And if you click on them, you get a little bit more information, but there's still no link to the website. I mean, Google wants you interacting with th what they control here, and that's it. So you have to maximize this. Now, one of the holy grails of this whole ecosystem is that you can have Google request a review and get a review, and then it's considered a Google verified job. Just remember what this looks like, because I have a, another slide on this. It's pretty cool. So just real quick on setup. So here's a list of some of them. You see like appliance repair, carpet cleaning. Uh, you, you set it up, you choose your times. The most important thing with choosing the times is you don't necessarily have to just do your business hours, but choose when you want to answer the phone. So one of the things we found in the moving industry is like that first half hour in the morning, everybody is busy getting the trucks out, getting the men going and getting the jobs aligned. Like they shouldn't be answering the phones and it's, it's just more productive to wait and start the, start the, the time for the ads after like our normal duty our normal morning duties are like done. Um, you're allowed to use six call outs and the call outs come from your GMB listing. So you kind of choose which ones are the most important. Um, your budget is adjustable, and I have an updated slide on this because it's gotten a little bit more complicated now. Um, so this slide, bidding just started. So this is brand new. This was a flat fixed rate ecosystem until I think October of this year. Now this change was actually supposed to be rolled out in Q1 of last year, but because of COVID, it all like got put on hold. But this is a bit of a problem because prior to this, it was everybody paid the same flat rate and, it, and the flat rate was based on a market. Now you could start bidding and this can get out, this can get out of control very quickly. As you see here, $41 is the base and that's what they were paying, what they were paying. You can, you can say, I want to bid $42, but the second your competitor goes $43, this can, you can see how this can kind of get out of control. Um, Opening categories here, just like I mentioned before on your GMB, categories are important because it opens up a breadth of keywords per category. But this is also important because this, if somebody comes in in one of these categories you don't select, then you can dispute that lead. And I'll, I, have the, I have like two cool slides on disputing. Um, the photos is one of the main ways you can control your message, just like regular GMB. And then this is a little bit newer from when it first launched, but in the geo-targeting, originally we were just choosing zip codes, but now we have the ability to cho choose cities and zip codes. And I highly recommend choosing city names. This is an old issue with like Google ads. It's still kind of an issue, but if somebody, if you just choose zip codes and somebody chooses a city and they're not in that city. So let's say from South Florida, I'm going to search for Denver moving company and it lets me choose my area of Denver. And I didn't have Denver as a city checked. I won't see the ad, but if you're in Denver, Google knows you're in Denver and you would see the ad because you're sitting in a zip code. So this is the lead management aspect. And this is where like the holy grail, this whole thing, it all comes together. And this is the beauty of, of local service ads. So this is what a screenshot looks like once you get inside local service ads. And 
when you click on one of the leads, you get a screen that pops up like this and you can listen to the call. Now notice that there's data that you can enter about that call. You can say the customer name, the customer email and your notes. If you're a small business and you're using this as your CRM, great. If you have your own CRM, you're probably not gonna use this, but this is how you are going to dispute and try to get credit back. Now, if you saw that we're paying $41 for every single call that we're charged for, $41, I mean, if you get 10 credits back, I mean, you're talking about 400 bucks, $410 very quickly. So this is a game that we have to play. So these are some of the examples of how we can dispute leads for credit. So look at that first one, job not service, not in your profile. So in the moving industry, we have out of state moving as not checked. So if somebody calls and they're moving from out of state, and we get that lead and charge for it, I can just check job not service and I get, a, I get an automatic, I mean, the credit's very fast. But what we found is that the people that are listening to these calls may not be based in the US and they may not understand geography. So they may not understand that it's a long distance move and they're moving over state lines. So we've gone back and, and this is a really good tip that's not in here. Uh, in the notes, we've actually said out of state move in the notes and then it seems like they see that it's like, okay, boom, you know, like we can give them credit for that one. Um, but again, this is the holy grail for reviews. So now you identified a lead, you did the job, you know, the job went well. So now we can go right here and we can tell Google, um, ask for a review now. I mean, think about that. That's Google asking for review. That's not you asking for review. That's not a driver asking review. That's not you asking, you know, giving hashtag marks. Like this is Google sending an email saying, you worked with this company, how would you rate them? And then these reviews are weighted heavier. So for local service ads, it's a game and you have to play it. And I work with some big companies that they don't want to play the game. They fight the game tooth and nail, but there's no choice. We have to play the game. Uh, I'm not happy about the second line, but aggregators are coming. There are some verticals that still are just really too blue collar or not technical enough that they're not filling up, you know, they're just not participating in it. And in those cases, like a thumbtack or a home advisor is a better scenario because, I mean, let's say a, you know, a self-practitioner electrician you know, is too busy working to worry about answering his phone and monitoring leads. So aggregators are, are entering just certain, um, verticals, luckily not moving. Um, if you have multi locations, there's actually an MCC or my client center that you can set up for local service ads, which is really cool and to manage it that way. Um, another thing that's really cool about local service ads is you can flip them like a switch on and off. There's no negative effect. If you're advertising on Google ads, you turn something on and off. There's, there's lots of repercussions of time. And when you're ad serving and click through rate, there's none of that with this. This is really like a light switch. You can turn on and off. Um, there are some issues though, that like if the phone number is wrong, there's not a place you could change the phone number. You actually have to email support or call support. If it's not linked to the right GMB, you have to call support. So there, there are some, some tough items. Um, and I said that LSA ads must evolve. We already are starting to get that, that auction lead pricing. And we're supposedly next quarter, I think in Q1, we're gonna get a, a, an API for better integration on reporting. So let's wrap up with just a quick COVID-19 update. Um, Q3, we saw some of the, I mean, just record breaking results for home services. There, the companies we work with that are in the home service industry did numbers in November that may have been better than the summer numbers. I mean, absolutely peak season. It's incredible what it's done. So this is, um, this is on the high side. I mean, if you're a restaurant, you're probably, you know, not super happy, but if you're in the home service business, I mean, anything, pest control, pool, repairs, moving, real estate, I mean, all of it is just thriving. On Google GMB, be careful with that COVID post because it's sticky and it holds real estate and your other content's not, you know, posting it post behind that. Um, for Google ads in general, just be careful with, with the new cadence. There seems to be a, a new timing and the weeks have flattened where in home services, we used to see like spikes on like Monday and you know, things would start early in the morning. Now there's a later start to the day and the timing between Mondays and Sundays is almost blurred that there's just like leads used to go like this. Now leads go like this through the week. It's, it's incredible how much that's changed. 
Um, what do we do now? And, and my Q1 2021 prediction is today, I would make sure you have that we are open in your meta tags. I would make sure that you're, you own your GMB and all the things we mentioned here, you're on top of. Uh, I, I really, it's, it's, it's very hard to predict. And, and what we work with companies that we're trying to forecast, even Google can't help us with forecasting because we're in like unprecedented traffic numbers that, I mean, we're looking at a Q1 that might blow Q1 of last year out of the water. Uh, that's home services. I mean, it's an amazing, you know, vertical to be in. And, and I think really almost anyone in the home services vertical is great. Um, I don't want to be specific. There's other verticals that are thriving as well, but that's a really good one. So um, in summary, we talked about local SEO, uh, GMB. We covered the SEO diet, kind of an abridged version. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about that I do just want to hit quickly is there is a big change coming next year in Google. It's called Passage SEO. This is completely new where Google can look at a long page and identify chunks of content and be able to rank on chunks of content. Uh, it, we can't really like, predict how this is going to work, but it's something that's like really exciting of how Google looks at websites and content. And instead of you know, having websites that have thousands of pages, maybe a website has a hundred pages of long content and it can, it knows how to go in and dig into content within a page. So that's pretty cool. Um, and local service ads, we expect them to keep evolving. We've, we just started seeing our first versions of the, the bidding and auction style to it. So uh, let's see what next quarter brings if we get some better reporting and APIs and stuff. That's it. Thank you. <clears throat> Perfect. Thank you. And thanks, guys, for sticking around. Um, we're going to go through a couple of the questions that folks were asking. Um, so I'm going to just kind of scroll back a little bit and uh, we'll share some of those. So one of the questions that we got from a couple of folks is um, if you are a non-location based business uh, and still want to leverage GMB. This is a question I had for you, too. Is <laughs> yeah, so, so this this um, this became very evident with uh, with Dan's business. So you can have a GMB without a location, and that's one of the options when you're setting it up. Google tends to be a little bit more restrictive, and there are certain categories of businesses that they don't want. Um, lead gen is being a big one. Is you, It's a really bad idea to, to put on a Google My Business listing that it says you're, you're doing lead generation. But besides that, I think you're okay. Um, in Dan's case, something that happened that was really neat is that we were doing all this work with trying to use a physical address and Google was giving us a hard time. And while we were doing this work, another listing just kind of popped up in Google and it was a, an address less, address less, address, address less listing. And it had like, it had half the work that we were doing, but it wasn't one that we controlled. So then we were able to grab that one and then just very gently start adding stuff to it. Now I say gently because we've seen in the past, at least 30 days, Google added some new AI checker to the GMB listings and they are popping listings for suspicious activity all the time now. And I mean, we spend, it's sad, but at the moment we're spending almost as much time getting listen, listings unsuspended as we used to be managing listings. So um, a couple of other questions. Let's do this rapid fire, see if we okay. can keep these quick. Sure. So Ruth Ann asked, can you offer a deal to someone who reviews, like some kind of incentive? And then she asked, how can I inspire people to review? They've been opening my email, but not reviewing they used to. Yeah. So just email alone, I don't recommend. I mean, I think it's, you know, start with a phone call, um, some personal touch, and then even SMS over email. Email to me is like the last resort. I just think people are ignoring the review requests from emails. And you, um, no, you really should not incentivize them. It's, it's basically the rules of like all of them. So I would try not to. Um, doesn't mean it doesn't happen. I mean, you could do something, if you could do it in person, you know, give them a 10% off coupon or something like that, fine. But um, I don't recommend it. I recommend incentivizing the person that's trying, that's in charge of getting the review. Perfect. Um, Cheryl asked, what if your keywords are so long that they have low to no volume? Example, Canadian remnant media buys. Yeah. So uh, you still, you need content on it and passage SEO may change, but that's where the SEO diet and that plan comes into play. Because if you know, you want to rank on those type of keywords, you probably only need like one blog post on that. And boom, you rank, you rank number one. When I did the analysis kind of late last night on uh, what I mentioned in the beginning of this, this very messed up um, 
site migration from Magento to Big Commerce, one of the domains that's doing really well is called Panhandle Westernware, Panhandle WW. And when we looked at where the refer all the ref, all the landing pages are in the site, you know, 80%, in fact, it wasn't even that much, maybe 60% of them were the top, the homepage and the top navigation pages, category pages, but then 40% of them went all the way down to these super, super specific, you know, very long tail keywords. Uh, we need to address that. So, you know, long tail keywords is still very much a real thing. It's, it's tougher if you're trying to target long tail keywords with paid search, but organic search is just having the content. Mm -hmm. Um, Michelle asked, uh, Joe said that GMB categories are chosen, uh, the, the GMB categories chosen are important for keywords. Where can we get more info about GMB categories and what categories best lend themselves to what type of posts? Yes. Yes. So, um, so the categories are specific to the business and you can have a main category and then subcategories. The, the way most people would do it is you start typing and then you get a drop down list as you're typing. So if I put in, um, you know, search marketing firm, I would probably get that as a category that's an option. But the other way to do it would be that I just search from my office location and put like search marketing firms and see who shows up and what categories they're ranking under. And then I might see that they're actually ranking under advertising agency. And then I might be better off going and ranking under advertising agency than search marketing company. So competitor research on your bigger keywords and see what shows up and it shows our category right in the results. Uh, Michelle asked, is it important to delete pages that are no longer accessible on the website, meaning they're on the server, but they don't show up on the live site? Yes. So that's also called an orphan page. And if the content is no longer relevant, the best thing to do there is actually create a 301 redirect, which means you're telling a search engine that this page is permanently gone and refer this to that to another page on the website. For SEO purposes, the reason why you would do that is you're passing any link value. So let's say you ran a unbelievable um, Cyber Monday deal in 2019, and it it's not relevant, you know, once you get past 2019, uh, but a lot of people may have linked to that and they may have written guides to buying and they're pointing at that. Well, you can then 301 redirect that to the 2020 Cyber Monday page and then get some automatic value of what was already there. So very good question. Yeah. Um, just wanted to let folks know that um, a couple of folks here were interested in an info session that we were going to hold on uh, our paid program and the scholarships that we offer for it. And I didn't want to cut you short. And um, so what we're going to do is we've moved that to 9 a.m. on Friday. And I just put in the chat uh, the link to RSVP for that. Just wanted to make sure that we were providing the maximum value as possible with the time we had available. Um, I have uh, two more questions, and then we'll wrap it up. Okay. Uh, Jane said, so I have a company in Costa Rica, Papagayo Luxury, and then an LLC in Miami Call, called something similar, but slightly different, uses the same website, papagayoluxury.com. Can I and should I do two separate GMB accounts or will it limit to just one unique company associated with the website? Can I use the same phone number on them? Yeah, so super question. Uh, so you should set up your website to have branches. And under your contact information, at minimum, you should have two pages, one page for the location here, one page for the location there, set up two GMBs, and then have each GMB website point to the individual location page. And make sure that those location pages are fully built out, that this is the location, this is where it services, this is the real address. So if somebody goes and looks, they match. But that's a... I mean, that's, that's the beginning of expansion. I mean, then that's the way you handle multi-locations. And we have two questions related to your phone number. That's great advice, by the way. I just did this week a session on customer experience and talked about how Zappos makes its customer service phone number so readily available, even though it's an e-commerce company. I, I think a strategic marketing error uh, that a lot of companies do is they make it difficult for their customers to reach out. And I think especially now when you're in a situation where phone is really our only human to human lifeline, um, strongly recommend that you make yourself available via phone. So Marianne says, I completely get that, Dan, that you want to put your phone number on your website. However, I'm concerned the number is my personal phone and that, that, I'm gonna, that will open me up to robocalls 
Can you speak for a few minutes about additional phone number option? How easy and costly is it to do? And then Ellen Marchman followed up to ask if Google Voice uh, is recommended to address that or talk talk a tone. Yeah. So uh, I swear I just talked about Google Voice a day or two ago in the same context. Um, I'm not familiar with pricing off the top of my head. I feel like Google Voice might be free or very low cost. Yeah, um, it's free. So it's free. So Google Voice is definitely an option. I'm not familiar with the features of like call routing and, and things like that. But if you were running a business and your cell phone was the main business phone number, then potentially, unless you have two cell phones, like you could turn off at eight o'clock and you don't want to answer the phone anymore. Um, Yes, you might be exposing yourself to robocalls. It, to me, that's uh, the cost of doing business. You, you want every call you could possibly get. And if you get robocalls, you deal with it. Uh, using, we normally, I think our cheap, the cheapest partner that we work with is call tracking metrics. And there's some really cool, you know, just routing functionality that, that it records the calls. It, it can route them different times. You can send them the voicemail different times. So something like that, I think is powerful. Uh, it just depends on your business and, and talking to people. Um, I still, I'm trying to remember the last example of a site I worked with that just would not put their phone number up. And I, I was kicking and screaming about it the whole way. Um, yeah. You, you got to have your guys, like we're, you're a small business. Like you, you're not Facebook. You're not Google. You're not Amazon. You need to be available. Maybe you didn't think you signed up for that when you started your small business, but that's the deal. The other thing is, the people whose calls you're not receiving are the people who are doing business with your competitors. <laughs> yeah. So it's totally up to you if you want to run your business that way. But I'm telling you, being available personally uh, will make a huge difference in growing your business to the point where eventually you'll be able to hire someone to answer that phone call. So, you know, in, when you're in that kind of earlier phase where you're the one answering the call, just accept that just like you didn't feel like you know, reading financial statements uh, or learning digital marketing because you are a great baker who wants to start a bakery, but that's the job that you signed up for, whether you realized it or not. You know, eventually, if you do answer enough phone calls and make enough human connections, you'll get to hire someone to answer the phone call for you eventually. Uh, when we start out, we're the CEO and the chief bottle washer, and uh, you got to take both those roles really seriously because that is your job when you're small. Joe Laratro, amazing. I'm going to recruit you to become an instructor at BizHack. Do you think you'd be willing to do that? Uh, very possible, yes. All right. I'm trying to commit you in public. Uh, <laughs> it's a neuromarketing. It's like, oh, if he says yes now. Guys, he said time. yes. Uh, Cheryl, unmute yourself. D does that count as a yes? Uh, I think it does. I, I, I saw it. I, I am as, with, with me as your witness. Yeah. I know. Exactly. <laughs> Joe, it's, it happened, man. You, you, you and I will launch the first BizHack SEO course ever. Uh, well, more on that soon, guys. I do think that's a possibility for 2021. This has been a beautiful way, frankly, to end our 2020 season, season two of BizHack Live. Uh, we do have one final graduation party or digital marketers celebration, 1230 next week. Absolutely encourage you guys to come to get some Huge dose of inspiration, digital marketing case studies, uh, a lot of celebration to, to be to come. Um, on 2021, we're going to kick off our new season with a financials for startups uh, webinar. Um, this is uh, dry stuff, but it's essential to running a business. Just like digital marketing is part of the seat you sit in when you're the owner of a company, so too is understanding how to build your financials and your forecasts. And we wanna start 2021 giving you a key to how to open, uh, to, to build your financials for the, next, the new year. Uh, after that, we're gonna talk about networking for business success, an incredibly important topic, especially given how constrained we are with networking. Uh, Jack Killian is an old fashioned networking guru. He's written books on the topic. I think you're gonna really love this one. And I did wanna invite those of you um, who are interested in our paid program. Um, you can apply uh, for a scholarship uh, for our Digital Marketers Edge paid program, which starts in January. Uh, it's really a accelerated course, 30 hours, 20 live uh, class hours and 10 hours of coaching to help you build out your 
uh, campaigns. A number of folks on the call right now are alumni of that program. Cheryl is one of the instructors. It's a paid program with one-on-one -on -one coaching. It starts in January. It's our primary product and uh, would love for you to be a part of, the, part of that experience. The Minority and Women-Led Business Scholarship is back. Uh, if you're interested in applying, go to try.bizhack.com slash scholarship. I just put the link into the URL. Uh, submit your scholarship application. And then this Friday at noon, uh, we are going to have a info session. Um, you can go to bizhack88.eventbrite.com. Or if you apply for a scholarship, we'll invite you automatically. Want to make sure you understand what the event is and what it's all about. Wanted to give you this parting thought. So Tony Shea, may he rest in peace, he died tragically recently in a house fire, said about running a business, have fun. The game is a lot more enjoyable when you're trying to do more than just make money. And so my message to you guys as we go uh, into the weekend and uh, get close to the holidays is I know it's tough right now if you're running a business. We're all scrambling and scraping to try to make, make it and survive. Uh, remember to have fun. And with that, thank you, Joe. Thanks to all of you for being here today. And look forward to seeing you next week at our Digital Marketers graduation and hopefully next year at our paid course, The Digital Marketers Edge. Thanks a lot, everybody.